Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily Digest. If you hate short podcasts, this is the one where we put together all of the shorter episodes into one longer episode. I'm Nathan Fox, that's Ben Olson. Together we're the founders of LSATdemon.com and our weekly podcast, Thinking LSAT. Uh, yeah, this email from Angela. Yeah, so it turns out to be a whole like chain. I was going back and forth with Angela uh, okay. via email. I manage the uh, daily at lsatdemon.com email address. And uh, so Angela emailed in and I responded. But she said, hey, guys, I really enjoy the podcast and LSAT Demon in general. I've been studying for the LSAT since the end of February 2022, and my score has barely changed. I've taken three practice tests and I've gone from a 151 to a 152. Based on what Nate has said in the past, I know that three tests are not enough to determine if I've improved. However, I was planning on taking the June LSAT and have not signed up yet due to my low score slash slow progress. I've been working full time and was just recently approved for part time to focus on my studies. Given my low score, I do not think that taking the June LSAT will benefit me. Should I set a goal for taking it in August? Is that too far away? Will I burn out? Thank you in advance, Angela. I mean, let's start Ben with, do you think she should take it in June? No, clearly not. You're miles away from your goal. You've only done three practice tests. You haven't done enough work. You're not ready. So don't take June. Should she set a goal for taking it in August? I don't care about someone um, loosely setting a goal in the sense that they're like aware of when that test is, they're aware of when the registration deadline is for that test. And in the back of their mind, they're thinking, okay, there's a decent possibility that I might end up taking it. But um, like August is it? I, I don't know. You have to be open to how you progress. Uh, yeah. Are you going to get to where you want to get? I mean, I could see Angela getting to like the mid 160s and being like, okay, great, based on her mindset right now. But hopefully by that time, she's thinking, hmm, once mid 160s, I actually want to do a lot better and decide to keep going. So it's really a decision you have to make before the registration deadline, not months before. Yeah, we don't have a registration deadline yet for August, by the way. Uh, I think that's because LSAC considers that the new cycle, right? They reset the cycle before the August test, which feels kind of arbitrary, but anyway, I guess they have to reset Mm -hmm. it somewhere. So why not right around the time school's starting? That's seems to be what they do. Um, so we don't know when the registration deadline is for August, but it'll be six weeks ahead. If Mm -hmm. history is any guide, it'll be six weeks ahead of the August test. So it'll be like beginning of July, Probably and yep. June, maybe. And you should make the decision whether you're going to take the August test once you get to that deadline. And they haven't even sent out, you know, any announcement about registering for the August test. So you could set a loose goal of like, boy, I would like to take it in August. But the goal needs to be I'm prepping hard for the LSAT whenever I end up taking it. And maybe I'll take it in August. Of course, Law schools only care about your highest score, Angela. So you might need to take it also in September and beyond. You also might not be ready for August, in which case you're definitely taking it in September or beyond. And uh, you need to be planning for multiple attempts. Law schools only care about your highest score. Yeah. You know, before we read on, I want to talk about this one question she says. She says, will I burn out? Hmm. What does that make you think about Angela's mindset? It it makes me kind of think that she's already burning out like she's or she's all she's already not liking it. She's mm-hmm. not enjoying the process. She's not having fun with it. Yeah. She's probably thinking about it in a lot of wrong ways, which I get into later. I was excited to talk to you about this because I think that what we have here is once I go through the back and forth, well, we'll see what you think, but yeah, I think that she's actually been, um, studying inefficiently, Mm, which is fun. No, it is not fun. I I don't think burnout has to happen. No, I don't think it does. Yeah. And I, I, this is what I wanted to get at is that I feel like if you're anticipating it, um, it's kind of, I just read this thing by, 
uh, Clayton Christensen. Have you heard of him? He's like a kind of a well-published um, business school professor who wrote like the okay. innovators dilemma. But anyways, um, he has what he calls the hundred percent rule. And his idea is it's easier to commit to something a hundred percent than 98% because you're, you're oh. sort of like, <laughs> huh, dude, I could vouch for that a million yeah. percent mm. specifically. Well, I mean, not to get too real for everybody, but, um, I quit drinking recently. Yeah. I, I quit drinking seven months ago Yep. after trying to moderate my drinking for seven years mm. where it was like, I know I'm drinking an unhealthy amount. This can't be good for me in the long run. What am I doing? I wish I wasn't drinking this much. And I would like try to cut back. And yeah. even if it was like, okay, 98%, you know, oh, I still do drink, but I'm yep. not going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to moderate it, you know, like, oh, well, I could have one beer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was really, really difficult. In fact, I failed. I mean, mm. I, I completely failed to moderate that mm. for, forever. I just yeah. like, and, uh, then when I, the only times that I was ever successful is mm -hmm. when I didn't drink at all for some period of time. And then yeah. it was actually super easy. So I would be like, no dry January. And I would do it with no problem. Yep. If I committed to it, if I decided yep. I was doing it and I, you know, I had to have somebody else maybe to help me to like, okay, we're doing this. All right. We're doing it dry January. Yep. Yeah. Or last year I did 90 days. Yeah. Because I knew I needed a break <laughs> and I quit for mm -hmm. 90 days and it was not hard at all. It was like, no, I, yeah, I thought about it a lot. Yeah. Crossed my mind a lot, but I didn't like want to do it. I was just like, no, cause I, that's, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And then once the 90 days was over and I tried to moderate again, impossible, not, yeah. could not happen. Was never going to happen. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, and then seven months ago I quit again and I, I, I don't know. I feel like I quit now for real, for real. Cause I just don't like, I don't want that <laughs> in my life. Yeah. I, I, I for sure don't want to be burned out on trying to moderate. Yeah. No, and I so, mean, and I think that's where that burnout partly comes from. When yeah. you're like partially committed, yeah. what you're really doing is you're committing to do something that you dislike for a short amount of time. And then you're, you're striving to get to that end, like to the finish line, right? Like, Oh, okay. And then I'll be free. And then, I'll, you know, it's like, you're constantly, or what do you, what do you do? You work for 60 hours a week for 20 years of your life because you, you, you want to save up enough so you can finally relax. It's like, okay, well, you know, Half of this is just what's happening right now. Why, why are you always like working towards the future? And I feel like that's what Angela is doing here. It's like this necessary evil that she has to get through. And it's like, geez, I really wish, wish I could get through it by June, but maybe I'll have to get through it by August. And it's like, no, no, no. Stop thinking yeah. about it that way. Fully commit to, I'm going to just work on this until I get the best score I can get, however long that takes. And I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to, I'm going to study in such a way that this is fun. And I see all the benefits. I mean, gosh, when you study for the LSAT, not only do you reduce your huge law school tuition debt, you also make yourself just like smarter, sharper, more, um, you know, I can't think of a word, which is horrible, but <laughs> more effective with the English language. There are so many things that come from this, like fully commit. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Decide that it's your life now. Decide that you're going to go to law school. You know, why, why are you doing this? Why are you even studying for the LSAT? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get better. <laughs> it does, the LSAT is going to be the funnest part of this whole journey. Oh, the LSAT's way more fun than like law school. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. You, you need, you definitely need to embrace it and get, you got to just get good at it. If you get good at it, then you're going to realize that it's fun. Yeah. You yeah. should study for the LSAT until it's fun. We got an email today. It's not on any of our agendas, but we got an email today from a guy who got 177, still mm. does the logic games for fun and is yeah. wondering if he should retake the test to try to get higher <laughs> <laughs> because he likes it because, yeah. you know, he got good at it. Yeah. And that's really what Angela should be focusing on rather than this focus on. Yeah, I think it's like the burnout is coming from the idea that it's a fixed like, oh, I thought I was going to have it over with. Mm hmm. 
Instead, you need to go more like me with drinking, which is just like, ain't no getting over it with it. I just like it's I'm not drinking today and I'm, I don't know, probably not drinking ever. It's who I am now. And so it's no longer a struggle. (laughs) It's no longer I'm halfway in and halfway out, which is draining. I hated, I hated moderating. I hated not drinking. Now I love not drinking because it's just like, well, that's me. I don't, yeah, I don't drink. I'm the guy that doesn't drink, whatever. It's fine. I just, (laughs) I don't. And it's so easy to not, but it was, it was so, so hard to like, sort of. Yeah. And I think that's Angela's thing here, right? She's like, sort of doing it. She certainly Mm. was not 100%. Now that's not to say that she needs to quit her job or even go part-time. But she has to devote herself. She has to like just uh, surrender kind of to the uh, surrender to the idea that uh, we don't know how long this is going to take and could take a long ass time. And you just kind of got to put one foot in front of the other. Maybe maybe um, an analogy here would be start seeing yourself as a lifelong learner. So this isn't going to end when August comes around. You're just one of those people who like, I learn things and I master them. And then I go to the next challenge as opposed to, I got to get through this. I'm going to, I'm going to go dry for two months and then, you know. Well, that's what a good lawyer, a good lawyer is going to be a lifelong learner. Yeah. Like you're not going to like learn everything and then just be a fucking wizard and only know your certain spells yeah. And never learn another one. It's like the no. law is always changing. <laughs> oh, my God. You're going to be like that's that's your thing. You're going to be like a student. You know, I want the word acolyte is into my hmm. mind. You're, you're going to be like a devotee of some area of law. Like, yeah. you know, if you're the b- world's best corporate immigration lawyer. Yeah. You're the best student of immigration law in the world. Yeah. That's how you stay the best. That's literally your job is to be a student of this area of the law. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it needs to be you just got to decide it's permanent. And also, Angela, it's not like it's just objectively too long. Right. We have there's people who have studied for the LSAT successfully. Like it took them three years to improve by 30 points. Sounds like a long time. But boy, their life is completely different. They are they are different people. You are literally yeah. talking to different people. It's like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Who are you? Oh, oh, their brain works much better. <laughs> yeah. A- you know, and they're going to just be rubbing shoulders with completely different people because of that 30 point LSAT improvement. Yeah. Anyway, I asked, so th- to get into the like nitty gritty of her studying, sure. I asked, how have you been studying? And she said, during the work week, I've been drilling for about an hour a day and trying to do timed sections with review. I don't like that trying to do timed section. You're either doing them or you're not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, by the way, if you're drilling an hour every day, that's awesome. Like, I I don't know, maybe, maybe don't drill one day and do a timed section instead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know why you're drilling for an hour and trying to do timed sections. That's that's maybe too much just because she, at the time she was working full time on Mm. the weekends. I do about two timed sections a day with review. Now that I'm writing this, I don't think I'm doing enough, but I see Ben shaking his head because why I feel like you're doing too much. It's like what you're, you're doing, you're doing a time section, you're reviewing, you're scoring in the one fifties. I would suspect that you do a time section and it's going to take you an hour to review it. Look, you're doing, You've just been given four games. How many did you actually do during that 35 minutes? Maybe you did two of them. Um, How did you do on them? Can you redo them? Watch the videos, pause, try to do it yourself. Like (laughs) you're, I feel like she's drilling for an hour a day and she's like reviewing quickly and be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, next, next. It becomes clear. Yeah. Right. So I said, well, wait a second now review with the demon or some other explanations or by yourself. Cause I wanted to get into, you know, it just sounds like, damn, you're doing an awful lot of review. If you're drilling, then that means you're missing questions, which entails review. And if you're doing sections, then you're certainly missing questions, which you say you're doing review. And if you're doing all that review and you're not improving, then my question is, well, 
let's talk about your review and yeah. listen to what she says. I use the demon in terms of drilling timed sections and practice tests. I review with myself first. And then if I get it wrong a second time and can't figure out why, then I use the demon for explanations. Jeez Louise. Well, if you're getting wrong the second time, you're really far off the mark. <laughs> well, and especially, Ben, what if she gets it right the second time? That's the problem. That's like, that is <laughs> That's 95% <laughs> of people, right? Like if you said, well, I'm going to eliminate oh, of course. one wrong answer here. What if you can't like, pick Thank the God answer I know. picked? <laughs> And then they go, oh, well, uh, this one. And it's like, that one turns out to be right. Oh, yeah. wow. A bunch of people just got 175. I wonder what happened. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you understand it. Yeah. Why is that the right answer? Why didn't you pick it the first time? Why is the wrong answer wrong? Why did you pick it the first time? How yeah. are you going to avoid making these mistakes next time? Those what about are the when she gets that yeah. you have to be asking yourself. So she's like shortcutting, right? She, she thinks, and I, I feel for her because it's like, she's, you know, clearly wants to follow our advice. But I, what I told her was, Hey, you got to start looking at those explanations. Like you're yeah. not improving. You're spending all this time, but you're not, you're not improving. Well, it's because this idea of like blind review. And then if you get it right, Oh, well then, okay, I got it. Good. All right. I get it now. You yeah. don't get it. You just you just knew that the answer was not the one <laughs> answer that you had previously picked. And so now it's like, oh, yeah, I got that. And you think it's like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's just be it's just a better fit. It's just, uh, you know, the one I picked is just not quite as good. No, the one you picked is wrong. It doesn't answer the question. Yep. The one you did pick is right. It answers the question. And so it's like for Angela, man maybe let go of even doing time sections and time tests for a while, maybe only drill. Yep. But like you need to genuinely confront your mistakes. Even when you get it right. I mean, how many people scoring 175 plus get it right and are like, yeah, but you know, I had some, a question about this other answer choice and I'm going to read that explanation and figure out 100% why that's wrong. I'm not, I, had some gaps. I've never really thought about this before, but this is an example of how blind review mm -hmm. could really lead people astray. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. I missed that question. So now I know I need to do it again and I'm going to do it without seeing the answer key, but mm -hmm. I'm going to try to get it right. But you I, still know that you you're not going to pick the answer that you picked the first time. Mm -hmm. So then you pick some other answer. Then you get it right and then you go, oh, well, you know, I got it right the second time through. So and, you you know, you you like half ass, like review it by yourself and you think you get it. You're like, well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, yeah, I got it the second time. I mean, that makes sense. Maybe. No, let's it doesn't. Look at this video of Ben Olsen explaining to you why the right answer is clearly right and why that wrong answer is clearly wrong, because if you're not, you're just doing the question again. Oh, I got it right this time. Like you need to get to the why. So in drilling, if people get the question wrong and they just, and they click continue without reviewing the explanation, it prompts them. We don't have that in time sections though, but it's kind of hard to implement that because people are jumping around in questions in review, but maybe we need to look at that. Yeah. And, and you could, you know, just imagine if I were there, Ima imagine, hmm. imagine me in your face going like, Hey, can you tell me why that right answer is right? <laughs> like, can you convince me that the yeah. right answer is right? The most skeptical person in the world. And can you also convince me why the wrong answer is wrong? Like, but it says this, that seems like it's a good answer for this question. Why, why, why is it not right? No, specifically. I mean, you just chose it, with it 30 seconds ago. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then if you can explain those, then I'm going to be like, okay, so now tell me why you picked this answer. Yes. There's the other level, right? There's not just the logic behind the test. There's like your process. What was wrong about your process that misled you? Now what? Okay. And then this right answer, the one that you've explained to me now is clearly right. 
that was there, wasn't it? In the answer to <laughs> that was on the page when you did the question. Okay. So, but you didn't pick it. Okay. Well, so, you, you know, it's like, you just have to sort of confront your own mortality in a way it's like, or you confront your own imperfections. It's like, well, okay. I didn't pick it. Why did I not? Why? You know, the universal answer to that too is so common. It's like, oh, I should have read more carefully. Okay, great. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Because you're not going to do anything different between now and the next question if you just say to yourself, oh, I got to read more carefully. Okay, what what exactly are you going to do to make that happen? And we've said a million times, you read the first sentence, not the argument, not the passage. That's where you start. Are you doing that? And then it's like, yes. Okay, are you pausing? Yes, no. <laughs> Almost certainly the answer is no to these questions. I have great hope for Angela, uh, but she absolutely does need to go deeper. Uh, you know, she's like, she's so concerned with, well, I got to do my hour of drilling. Plus I got to do my time section. Plus I got to do my two time sections per day on the weekends. Plus I got to do full tests sometimes. And it's like, no, you need to understand one of your mistakes <laughs> today, right now. Like you yep. need to, you need to really dig in there and figure it out because you're, you're, you're Angela, you're making the same mistake on every damn test. You're making the same, you're making the same 10 mistakes every single time you sit down to study because yep. you're not learning enough in your reviewing. Today we have an email from Nikki. Yeah. Uh, Nikki sent us a graphic. We'll, uh, figure out how to distribute this along with the episode. I'm sure. Her email says, I saw this on Facebook and it reminded me of your LSAT advice to study where whenever you can, even if it's just one LR question, figured I'd share it with y'all. Uh, oh, good. We have a, it's a, we got the handle even on the image. It's Sarah Arnold Hall, Sarah H Arnold Hall, maybe. Mm. Um, and it says showing up daily what we think it means. And it's got a whole bunch of full circles. Mm -hmm. And then below that, what it actually means. And it's got a chain of, well, a couple full circles, a couple real, almost empty circles, a couple half full circles, a little more than half, a little below half, almost full, <laughs> but like yeah. only a couple of them are full is yeah. the point. Yeah. Uh, I, I like it. I think it's a, I think it's a pretty cool visualization. What do you think? Yeah, I like it. And I would say, look, if you do one question and you're fully engaged with that question and learning from it, I would count it as a full circle, even if it's only 10 minutes. Yeah. It's the gym door thing. Yeah. You know, like, um, some days are harder than others y'all. <laughs> yeah. That's life. Yep. And you got to keep moving, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have to climb the whole mountain today. You have to make one step forward. Yep. And, uh, yeah, absolutely, man. If you do, you know, like you, if you're taking your drilling seriously in the demon, then the demon's going to be giving you harder and harder questions. Right. Yeah. So you fire up the demon, you do one question, you take your time with it you solve it, you get it right. You feel hundred percent. You click submit. You got it right. If that's all you got for today, then that's all you got for today. Yeah. And you might though, like fool yourself, right? You might be tricked. You might like trick yourself into doing, doing more than you thought you could. Cause you might squeeze out another rep. Yeah. And, uh, but if that's all you, or, you know, like, boy, consider the opposite too, right? You take your time with it, do your best on it. You really think you've unlocked it. You think you figured it out. You hit submit, you get it wrong. Yep. And now you've got the really valuable, important piece, which is the review part. Mm -hmm. And you really think it through, you know, we're there to help read the explanation, watch the videos, Get to your, get yourself to that point where you feel the click. Yeah. Um, hit the ask button. If you have to like get, get help, get the help you need and do it right now. Don't put it off. Don't boy, really don't put that off for tomorrow. 
Like do the review now because that's the valuable part. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, once you've done that review of that one question and if that's all you got, then you get to check the box you you did today. Yep. Streak alive, <laughs> even if it's just one question. I mean, honestly, I would, you know, we recorded earlier that episode with uh, Rachel or no, Angela. Sorry, my bad. Uh, Angela, who was like doing an hour of drilling every day, plus trying to do timed sections, plus review, plus doing two time sections on the weekends. It, she was like going for only, it sounds like full circles, right? Yeah, she was getting full circles in terms of time. Right. But not in terms of actual engagement or moving the ball forward. So I would say mm -hmm. she looks more like this second row of incomplete circles, whereas someone who maybe only spent 20 minutes one day because they just were fully engaged but then had to check out for some other reason, they had to go do something and they reviewed it carefully. Boy, that's a full circle. You're, you're moving the ball forward. Yeah. A little bit goes a long way. Just, uh, just keep, keep making those incremental baby steps. Someday you're, some days you're going to have the time and energy and focus to do a lot, but other days, yeah, you're going to just try to do that little bit, no matter what, uh, just kind of show up. You know, uh, to dig a little deeper here, if you, if you follow this where you're doing a little bit every day and your circles are not completely full, right? If you're still trying the best you can, what you're going to find is that they get easier and easier to fill up. <laughs> so really, over time, you're going to see more and more full circles. I see it with the gym all the time. When I get back into it, it's like, oh, this is rough. And then, but then it gets easier and it's like, start hitting the stride again, you know? Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. Um, I'm Francesca Civilotti. I'm a teacher and tutor at the Demon. And I'm here with our student, Brandon. Brandon, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Great, thanks. Happy to be back on the podcast. So today we're actually going to be talking about a strategy that Brandon came up with for RC and that I've shared with some of my classes and some of my students and just gotten some really strong positive feedback on it. And I think that probably no matter what level you're at, you could probably benefit from incorporating it to some extent into your RC toolkit. So Brandon, why don't you talk to us about what really what it's all about? Yeah, so the strategy could probably be best summed up by saying, um, asking yourself a question as you're going through your RC passage. Uh, and that question is, what am I learning right now? Or what have I learned? Usually, uh, usually I summarize a paragraph or a sentence with, you know, what have I learned? Or what am I learning kind of reels me back in if I notice myself starting to wander? Yeah, yeah. So really, everything that we try to teach at the demon is just about making the test more simple. Um, and this strategy is about as simple as it gets. It's really just a way to like kind of check in with yourself as you go through it. And when you get to the end of the passage, of course, you want to be um, predicting what the main point is going to be and kind of recapping it in your head in that way. But that doesn't mean that you have to just save that for the end of the passage. Um, do you find that this is something that like helps with uh, drifting off in attention or anything like that? Like when, when do you usually use this? Yeah. So first of all, great question. Um, it's, it's super holistic, right? Like as I'm going through sentence by sentence and that kind of writes large as paragraph by paragraph. And then, you know, as the whole passage, um, I I've almost started using it like as a mantra, right? So I'll get through a sentence and I'll ask myself, what am I learning? What have I learned? it puts me in a headspace where I can both start to predict a little bit about what's to come. So I'm really engaged with the passage, whether it's like the super dry science stuff that I don't personally enjoy, or if it's, you know, <laughs> it's the topics like law that I really love, like the stuff that really gets my goat. Um, regardless of the subject matter, it keeps me engaged and kind of forces me to think ahead. It also really forces me to evaluate the kind of the flow of the passage. So, you know, we have some passages that write like essays and we have some that write, you know, are they or they read like um, like a really strong thesis statement. Our, our author will take like a really strong point of view, but sometimes they're not like that at all. So it kind of forces you to engage with not only the structure of what you're reading, but also the flow. Uh, it really gets you in their headspace. Kind of um, I, I treat it almost like a student teacher relationship with the passage. Right. Like you hear Ben and Nathan say all the time. 
what is your point? Like, why, why have you wasted my time with these 15 sentences? And, you know, if I'm asking myself, what am I learning right now? What are you trying to teach me? It's keeping me kind of in that headspace of like, why are you wasting my time with this? Well, you're wasting my time with this because for whatever reason you want to talk about birds and cholesterol. <laughs> That's like what we're talking about today. Uh, and again, it, I find myself now using it pretty much all the time. Like at first it was more of a, okay, I'm getting a little distracted. Reel me back in. Like, what did I learn just now? Um, and yeah, it was great for kind of getting the main point paragraph by paragraph. Um, and then again, you know, doing that writes large as uh, the whole passage. Right. But now it's like, I do it almost as a, I do it almost as a reaction after every sentence to like really keep me engaged and kind of force me to pace myself. And I've just found that, well, I mean, obviously I have the data of my scores have gotten a lot better in practice, but, um, you know, in general, I can pretty much take any, any passage in the abstract and just nail it regardless of time constraints. So it's been really helpful for me. Yeah, that's a great way to pull it, put it. And it actually makes me think a lot of how I read through passages when I'm teaching my reading comprehension class, um, which is every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, little plug there. But it's really <laughs> after every single sentence, I'm asking myself that same question. I wasn't doing it subconsciously, but it's sort of how can I say this in my own words? What am I learning right now? What are we talking about? What's a different way to make the same idea just even more simple? It's really a process that you can use throughout the test, doing a little kind of story time by yourself. And I really liked how you also, you were talking about how on these RC passages, a lot of the time the content is just extremely boring to most people. It's <laughs> yeah. very yeah. strange stuff also sometimes, just things that we're not used to reading about, things that we would probably not choose to read about for any other reason. But it nonetheless is something that stands between you and achieving this goal of yours to get into law school and to go for free. Um, so you better figure out a way to make it interesting, right? And if you remind yourself yeah. that you're always learning on this test. You're learning about something. It might not be valuable to you ever again, but you're learning about something. And if you are a person who enjoys learning for the sake of learning, just asking yourself, what am I learning about right now? Can be a great way to bring you right back into the moment. Is there anything else that you want to say about that, Brandon? Uh, just, I think it, I think it bears noting that it's not, you know, purely my invention. It's, it's something I kind of came up with, but I definitely want to give credit to, to Ben in some of his older videos when I was studying logic games, especially early on. So he has this, uh, this statement you constantly see when you're drilling games, which is when you get stuck on a game, you ask yourself who's left. Well, what am I learning right now? That question was kind of born of the same logic, right? Of, okay, I've hit this spot where I'm losing myself a little bit, or I'm, I'm losing track of what was important to be paying attention to. Uh, so how can I reel myself back in? And I think that's where, again, it's almost like reps at the gym, right? You, you go through this activity, you go through this uh, exercise, and the more you do it, the more subconscious that muscle memory becomes. So now, you know, whereas originally I was almost doing it out loud whenever I would drill, now it's just like I do it subconsciously in my head as I'm going and, you know, send me your most boring stuff on the LSAT, I'm going to stay engaged with it using that, using that question. So. Totally. It goes to show that your strategies on one section are probably going to transfer in some way to every other section because the LSAT is only testing the same core set of skills over and over again. I'm Dylan Horowitz. That's Nathan Fox. He's my boss, the founder of the LSAT demon. Nathan, this is your show. Uh, how do you want to get started? <laughs> well, I guess um, it would be really good to introduce you. You are the uh, right now you're actually the primary person behind our ask button. Ask has turned into this amazing feature at LSAT Demon where um, all our students can email in uh, questions. I did a real quick little bit of uh, research and I yesterday we had 28 questions from students. You responded to 25 of them. Today, we had 18 questions, or sorry, yesterday, sorry, Monday, we had uh, 28, and you responded to 25. Tuesday, we had 18 questions, and you responded to 12 of them. I wanted to thank you for all of that hard work. I also think mm -hmm. it's just going to be cool to talk about, like, 
what your life looks like on the ask yeah. button. But maybe you want to introduce people. I mean, like, where are you? What do you do? What's your whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, but first, at the risk of making a logical fallacy, I do <laughs> think the fact that I'm the primary person is why it became such a great feature. <laughs> <laughs> no. Totally. Yes, yeah, so yeah. you can have all the credit. It's not me. I mean, I no, write no. like what? I do one a day or something like that mm -hmm. when they now, when obviously I'm one. kidding. <laughs> Yeah. The the whole team is great. I'm not the only one, but no, no, no. We uh, have an amazing yeah. team there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So a bit about me. Uh, last year, I graduated from the University of Michigan and uh, studied public policy. Uh, I'm taking a gap year this year to work for you. Uh, and I'm. it's such a great experience. People always say, like, do something that you enjoy doing, you're good at, and someone will pay you to do it. And this is it. So couldn't think of a better way to spend this year. And in the fall, I'm heading to Harvard Law. And I'm really excited and a little nervous, but mostly excited. <laughs> awesome. We just had uh, Sarah on the show. She's a 1L at Harvard Law. And she said uh, very specifically that she has never worked harder in her entire life. She's kind of yeah, shocked, that's, that's actually. That's what I hear. And mostly where the nerves come from. But uh, I'm going to go in humble and just work my hardest, same as what I've done to get to the point where I got into Harvard. So hopefully uh, things will go well. Cool. So what's it like working on the ask button? What are I guess you must you've got like a unique kind of an insight, really, because nobody else does quite what you do. I mean, you're like virtual mm -hmm. email only LSAT teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. So how how's that go for you? What what do you I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy it. Um, I'm not someone who absolutely needs like the face to face part of tutoring to like get something out of it. Mm -hmm. Like just giving someone a, a response to their question and then them writing back like, thank you so much. It This makes so much sense. Uh, it really makes me feel like what I'm doing has a purpose and makes it a lot easier to sign on and start knocking out requests. Um, but I think what's so interesting is how I can go from one request with a student at a certain level and then talk about the test a certain way to make them understand. And then you get someone else who is at a completely different level who demonstrates like such great mastery of the stuff, but has a, a few lapses in their understanding and being able to engage like that. Uh, the variety just always keeps things interesting. And of course, variety, not just in the level of the students uh, writing in, but in the kinds of questions they uh, write. And so I think it gives me like a really good like sample of what do students struggle with on this test? And what are some of the most common mistakes students make? And it's just been uh, a lot of fun doing that. What, uh, what types of things have you seen people? I know that as a classroom teacher, uh, I see people making the same mistakes in pretty much every class. What, uh, mm -hmm. what do you see people doing wrong all the time? Yeah, well, I mean, anyone who's listened to like any episode of the Thinking LSAT podcast or the Demon Daily knows that like pretty much most mistakes are just the student didn't understand the passage well enough. They didn't read it correctly. They didn't grapple with it, whatever it may be. But what I didn't realize until I started like doing the ask button is that so many students make unforced errors on the LSAT where they understood the passage, but they still got the question wrong. And the most common trend as to why that happens is they don't actually understand what the question is asking them to do. Uh, I notice a lot of people, they don't read the question. They identify the question. They just glance at it and they go, oh, that matches mm. like this archetype of what a you know necessary assumption question is. But they don't actually know what it is that that question is asking them to do. That, yeah, I would think, I mean, that happens at a higher level where, where students are even familiar with the idea of question types. Mm -hmm. It happens at lower levels too, where people, they just don't 
they, they don't they're not even familiar with question types at all but they still just don't read the question. They're not, they're mm -hmm. like not answering the question. Yeah. It's hard and to describe why people don't do it. <laughs> yeah. And the, when I get like, there are occasionally times when I don't mind this, but people like fervently argue against me who are just, you know, they're incorrect, but like they're passionately defending their side, which I guess there is, you know, some nobility in that. Um, but where, where I see it the most is with people who, misinterpret the question and they are absolutely sure that they correctly answered the question they thought they were answering, but not the real one. And I have a, a few examples of this. Like the difference between a must be true question and a supported question is like obvious to like you and me. Like for a must be true question, the right answer is something that absolutely needs to be proven by the passage. Yeah. Supported questions is just something that you know, the passage suggested or it supported but didn't prove it. Significant overlap, though, because if yes. we find an answer that is proven by the passage, then that's the mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. OK. But the amount of que uh, like questions I get uh, that like argue against an answer choice uh, uh, on a supported question because they're like, oh, well, technically, isn't it possible that this isn't really true? And right. it's like, well, yes, but that's that's your you're holding this answer choice to too high of a bar. Right. And we see this a lot on strengthen and weaken questions too. Like for a strengthen question, they're like, wait, even if this answer choice is true, it's still possible that the you know conclusion isn't really proven. And it's like, yes, but strengthen questions are about making the conclusion more likely to be true, not about proving it definitively, which of course, is a sufficient assumption question. Right. Yeah, uh, I, I totally get that. One of the things I've found myself saying a lot in class recently is that you have to interpret one of the answers in a way that makes it make perfect sense. So uh, it doesn't have to, on a strengthened question, prove the argument. It, it doesn't, on a supported question, have to be proven by the facts there can be like quibbles with these answers, but you've eliminated the other four. Like you can't pick the other four answers. And one of the answers was intended by the test makers to be perfect. You know, mm -hmm. they're like lawyers. They're very literal people. So the correct answer does answer the question. And when they say which one of the following is most strongly supported by the information above, well, one of the answers, it doesn't have to be proven by that information above, but they meant for one of those answers to be correct. And so you can say, well, this doesn't necessarily have to be true. Yeah, but I can say, I, I know, but of those five, it's the one that is best supported by those facts. And look, here's the facts that support this answer. This is what they meant. Mm -hmm. You could twist it. You could interpret it in some weird way that it, that it, that it's wrong, but the other four answers are just straight wrong. And this one answer is what they meant to be correct. And you do have to like, so it's, it's, there's, it's kind of like a irony because on the first pass through, we're going to be like ultra hyper aggressively eliminating answers. But then one of the answers does have to be correct. And so we're not going to like get rid of it on some weird twisted interpretation of like, well, it could possibly be wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, what that reminded me of is how on LR, which is I feel like not a lot of people know this because most people skip the instructions at the beginning as they should when the clock is ticking. But we are actually allowed to assume things. Yeah. Now, they have to be reasonable assumptions. And what I get is like, well, for you, D is wrong because you said we have to make this assumption, but E is right. And you said we make this other assumption. And it's like, well, yeah, because D is an unreasonable assumption that we need to make for that to be right. Whereas the assumption we have to make for E, it's common sense. It's the kind of thing where, of course, that's a thing we're allowed to assume and People ask me, like, well, how do I know whether it's reasonable or not? And honestly, I don't know what a good answer to that is, because I feel like even in law, like, 
how do you define reasonable doubt? It isn't it just kind of like a gut feeling? Like, is there a definition yeah. of what is or isn't reasonable? Yeah, I mean, I would say, could would you like stand up in court and make that argument, or <laughs> I, or would you like? Really, in in your one L class or whatever, you're gonna like raise your hand and you're gonna make that objection. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you have to vouch for one of these five, and it it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be the best one. But like, they've written this test so that four of the answers, they're embarrassing. Like they're not. It's not like second best. It, they're they're not close. They're embarrassingly bad. Like if you stood up in court and said this, you would get shot down just immediately <laughs> by the judge or by the opposing counsel and you would look like an ass. And one of them, even though you might be on slightly shaky ground, it's like at least not a total tragedy to pick it. And you know, it's like, okay, look, you're a criminal defense attorney. Your guy obviously did it. You still have to defend him anyway. You're going to make the best case you can possibly make. And if sometimes you have to sort of be like, well, I mean, here, this is uh, this is my argument. Well, OK, it's not like it has to be perfect. It just has to be better. And it's significantly better. It's not like it's slightly better. It's way, way better than these other answer choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I laughed when you said that, because just today, a few hours ago, I literally wrote to someone would you stand up in court and say, your yeah. honor, the thing they said? And it 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 makes it so much easier to see like when you're just make, you're being unreasonable, like really putting yourself in the shoes. I think it's just so important to like really think of LR as lawyer shit. Like that's what it is. Do you understand arguments yeah. and can you criticize them? Uh, Reading comp too, man, mm-hmm. we're. We're on this topic of people not reading the question, right? Uh, Just last night in my class, uh, someone hung out after class to ask me about this question. She goes, well, the question says, which one of the following laws? And so that's why I picked whichever answer. And and I'm like, but wait, (laughs) The question doesn't say which one of the following laws. The question says, which one of the following laws would conform most closely to the position articulated by the author of passage A, but not that articulated by the author of passage B? And it's like you have to sort of hold people's hands. And it's not like any Mm -hmm. she understands all of those words. Mm-hmm. she's just not paying attention to all of those words. Like she's not actually reading them and figuring out what the damn question asks. I mean, the question is saying, essentially, it boils down to, well, which one of these does passage A agree with, but passage B disagrees mm-hmm. with? And she w- <laughs> she was answering it based on the first like four words. She's like, well, no, I mean, I thought that one was good because they're looking for a law and this one was more general. And so th- I, it was a law. I was like, Oh my God, you're not like, you're just not even reading the, you're not answering the question at all. It's a tragedy. Is there any explanation for it other than people feel a sense of urgency and they want to take a shortcut whenever they can? How else would you explain that? Just not reading the question. They were trained to do it by their undergrad education or by their high school education or by at some point along the line, they learned these gimmicky ways of doing multiple choice where it was just like, well, I mean, I don't have to read everything. I don't have to actually understand it. And in LSAT world, if they come from a background in, you know, Kaplan or some other sort of chintzy program that is focusing on these gimmicks and tricks and shortcuts, Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard the founders of Princeton Review on Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, which I was a just garbage <laughs> podcast about the LSAT. But the founders of the Princeton Review are like, well, on reading comp, we don't have enough time to actually understand. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> which is just <laughs> that's just a hundred thousand percent wrong. Like it couldn't be more wrong. You, you have to understand mm-hmm. you are not going to be answering these questions correctly if you don't understand what they say. You have to understand yeah. the passage. You have to understand the question and you have to understand the answer that you pick. Mm -hmm. You don't have to necessarily understand all of the wrong answers because we can eliminate those frequently. Just, you know, it's like, what? I don't even know what this means. Goodbye. But the right answer is the one that answers the question. But that Mm -hmm. does mean that you have to actually read God, the question. Uh, Along this this same uh, vein, I wish, you know how whenever there's an accept, they make it like all caps and like bolded? (laughs) Yes. I wish they did that for the word most because that changes what a question is asking you to do. And I feel like students just gloss over it completely. Um, There's just there's this one question that I've answered the same question over and over until I was finally like, why don't I just add this to the explanation? Because I want to preempt these objections, but it's a paradox question where we have to explain a trend over like a, a time span. And one of the answer choices explains it over 90% of that time span. So like 10% of it, like we still don't know why that trend is happening. But this answer choice explains 90% of why this trend is happening. You, as you would imagine, the other four answer choices don't explain anything at all. Right. Not close. All these students are like, yeah, instead of focusing on that 90% that answers it, they're just like, they're focused on that 10%. Like what? It, it doesn't fully explain it. But if yeah. you read the question, it's which one of the following, if true, most explains the apparent discrepancy. Right. And 90% doesn't have to be is perfect. more than the rest. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> just has to be overwhelmingly better than all the other answers, mm-hmm. and which is not that hard because the other answers are complete trash. Uh, I'm excited about Elizabeth's new wrong answer wreckers class that she's doing on Sunday afternoons for LSAT Demon Live subscribers because she's going to spend extra time there, like conclusively, thoroughly dismissing the wrong answers. You know, and Mm -hmm. in class, like when I do explanations, I frequently am like, I don't even understand that. Goodbye. Or I can see this is going in the wrong direction. Goodbye. And students sometimes want like more time to, Mm -hmm. you know, the wrong answers can be wrong for three different reasons sometimes. And so that's what that class is going to do. It's going to like take that extra time to, to really Mm -hmm. just show people how bad these (laughs) answers actually are. I mean, frequently one of my first responses to people when they're like, when they make these kinds of quibbles that you're talking about, Dylan, where they're like, well, this isn't a perfect answer. I just right away. I'm like, yeah, okay. What are you going to pick though? (laughs) <laughs> like, what else are you going to possibly pick? Uh-huh. Because your Ben has talked about this on Thinking LSAT before, too, where it's like, well, let's hear your argument for this other answer. Let's let's mm-hmm. let's look at how ridiculous like it's just completely specious. It makes no sense. Like what? That's a wild stretch that you're making to get to that. Mm hmm. And then now you're making what quibble against this answer that we like, that we know is correct, that everyone agrees is the is the right answer. Um, oh, wow. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think that it's it'll be good to learn this lesson now to just apply the right burden to these answer choices so that, you know, when you're a lawyer and you are like, you know, tr- you're litigating a civil case, you're not like, oh, they didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That's not the burden. We need to know the burden. And it's the same yeah. thing here. Totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. I, I want to be clear about like, I really, I think the way to approach these answers, I do want you to disrespect the answer choices. Mm-hmm. I want you to, to go into the answer choices, expecting them to be wrong. Four out of five of them are wrong. A is wrong 80% of the time. I want you to read A looking for reasons why it's wrong. And I want you to do the same thing for B, C, D, and E. And one of the answers, you're not going to be able to disprove. One of the answers, you're going to be like, whoa, oh, yeah, okay. That's, you know, either that's what I predicted or it's not what I predicted, but I totally see how it answers the question. And the other four answers you're going to eliminate. And that's the one answer. Boom. That's how it happens like 90% of the time. 10% of the time, I will eliminate all five. 
right? Because I'm I'm so yeah. critical that I'm looking for reasons to let him go. And I, I don't think about it like super deeply. It's just like, nope, this isn't great, but goodbye. And then I get rid of all five. Then I have to go back through and be a little bit more generous, right? Because one mm-hmm. of them does have to be right. So I in the old days on pencil and paper LSAT, I would make a little tick mark across the answers that I thought I had eliminated. And then when I eliminated all five, which again would happen like one out of 10 questions, then I would go back through and I would like cross out the answers the other way to be a little. And then I would give them a little bit more respect where I would be like, Mm -hmm. well, one of these guys is not conclusively wrong, but still, oh no, but that's conclusively wrong. That's conclusively wrong. That's conclusively wrong. Oh, I see this one. Mm This other one. Yeah, that's conclusively wrong. Yeah, this one. I didn't like it because of some little quibble, but it can't be any of these other four. And now I see what they meant. That does answer the question, like kind of double check. Is it really answering the question or you double check the passage on reading comp to go? Yeah, okay. there's evidence here Mm -hmm. for this. All right. I see what they're saying. That's the answer. Yeah. And I don't think it could be understated how much better it is to eliminate five answer choices than to leave two open. Yeah, totally. The amount of questions that are like, oh, why is C better than D or something like that? (laughs) And it's like, they say two completely different things. It's not like they're very similar, but like one word is different. Like They just convey completely different ideas. And one of them answers the question definitively. And one of them definitively does not answer the question. Yeah, I had that last night on a sufficient assumption question. It was right at the end of class. And this dude, we were doing a pretty hard sufficient assumption question. And this guy is like kind of a he's sort of new to the demon. Mm -hmm. And I was yelling about how you have to predict the answer on a sufficient assumption question. And I really don't have any patience for anything that doesn't just you know, fill the gap. Like I I'm going to predict the answer. I see what the evidence is. I see what the conclusion is. I know how to get from the evidence to the conclusion. So I'm going to predict the answer because that's how you do sufficient assumption questions. And (laughs) we had this whole lengthy, like, I felt like it was a 20 minute discussion about this whole question. And then the dude's like, well, yeah, I mean, that's what I predicted too. But then a, like I, I, why is D better than A? <laughs> and I look at A and it doesn't even have one of the elements that I was looking for. It was just like it was some other weird like reinforcement of one of the existing premises or something. It was like and, and I just had to be like, nope, I interrupted the guy. Poor guy. I, I interrupted him and I'm just like, nope, uh, uh-uh, nope. Stop talking. I don't. Sorry. Dude, (laughs) you don't know what you're doing at all on a sufficient assumption question. It's not like this answer is slightly better than that other answer. One of them is a sufficient assumption. That one isn't even close to a sufficient assumption. Like he was arguing about the fourth best answer, literally, because there were two other answers that were both sufficient and necessary. They were confusing sufficient and necessary on the right answer. Right. So Mm -hmm. it was like, oh, these two. Now, these two, they have all the right elements, but they're just backward. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they're equivalent to each other, which makes them both wrong. But (laughs) your answer (laughs) is like, huh? What are you even? I mean, whatever. It just shows you that you there's lots of room that these people can improve. That just that made me think of one of my favorite ways to start a message. And by favorite, I mean, least favorite. Uh, I understand why A is right. But why is D wrong? Yeah. One of those things, though, that is a paradox. Yeah. You get why the right answer is right, but you don't get how the wrong, a wrong answer is wrong. They're not the same. Like, unless you think they literally think they say the same thing, then it's like, okay, let's clear up. This one's actually saying this. Yeah. But if you can tell that they convey different ideas and you know why one of them is right, I. I have a hard time, and maybe this is just a fault of me as this kind of instructor. I have a hard time understanding that, how you can know the right answer is right, but not how something that is completely different is wrong. Well, I think it depends on the question type. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's many ways to strengthen an argument. There are many necessary assumptions for an argument. There are many potential explanations for a paradox Mm -hmm. question. So it 
it's actually two separate mistakes, right? The, yeah. The right answer is right because it answers the question. The wrong answer is wrong because it doesn't answer the question. But the right answer doesn't really have anything to do with the wrong answer unless mm-hmm. we're talking about we were talking about a sufficient assumption yeah. question. And right? That is what I was thinking of. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of th- getting this question on a bunch of sufficient assumption questions. Right. But yeah, for s- strengthen, like, yeah, two things can strengthen it and I one see. strengthens more. That's understandable. This email is to you, Nathan. It's yeah, from, from a Demon a, Live student. Yep. It says, uh, regarding January 2023 admissions, in scouring the 509 reports on the LSAT Demon Scholarship Estimator, that's uh, lsatdemon.com slash scholarships, by the way, I discovered that many of the schools where my stats predict full slash half or more tuition scholarships offer both August and January start dates. At your earlier suggestion, I reached out to several of them, Arizona, Case Western, California Western. Uh, She provided a helpful attachment. She's got a spreadsheet going with keeping track of people's phone numbers and their responses to her. Very lawyerly thing to do. Yep. Uh, And I discovered that their spring 2023 applications open in May or June of 2022. I was told that scholarships are equivalent to what I would be offered if I applied for fall 2023 admission. That's what they told you. The only difference is that summer classes are required the first year. So you attend classes continuously for four semesters, then have a summer break between 2L, 3L, and you finish in spring or summer of 2025. So you know, you graduate in, uh, you could say it's two and a half years, but you just have to go to your first summer. You're skipping your first semester and you're doing it during your first summer, basically. And your second summer, right? Um, no. How do you get four semesters? Cause it's like, I think spring, she meant five semesters. Five she sem- says summer oh. break between two L and three L. I'm pretty oh. sure that she must've met five semesters there. I mean, okay. it's the four semesters that she would normally have done plus one summer, so five semesters. Hmm. Anyway, um, with that in mind, would there be a downside to applying early, that is May slash June 2022, and broadly to these 20 to 30 schools that do offer these start dates with my April of 2022 LSAT? All my other materials are ready. Relocating in December makes a lot of sense for me as my lease is on a calendar year cycle. Boy, that's an example of a very normal (laughs) thing to be thinking about, but probably should not be at all part of your analysis for how you're playing this game. Yep. I mean, most leases, if you don't re-up, they just automatically turn to month to month, right? Um, you may need to say that you want to go month to month, but yeah, you could go month to month or move somewhere else and go month to month. Um, they might jack your rent up a little bit. You might be able to negotiate a shorter term, like negotiate a new six term, a six month lease or something. My problem is I don't, I'm not sure if she means to say, I think some of these schools she has confirmed offer the, the fall or sorry, the, uh, whatever weird spring start. Hmm. What about the others? (laughs) Right. And, and yeah, so, you know, if you apply to a school that starts in spring, they've just won because now you're competing against, they're competing against much fewer schools. Yeah. It. So, and, and so what she's trying to do is she's, she's trying to apply early So those applications open in May slash June of 2022. She's going to apply to those schools right away for a spring 2023 uh, start date. Well, it's just as long as you still apply in September for the schools that don't offer that early start date. I hope that's what she meant. I mean, it's just (laughs) the problem with this whole plan is that I know based on her previous we we talked about her numbers earlier and i know that she's not it doesn't seem like she's getting the very best lsat she possibly can you know the schools are not you know maybe she's happy to go to one of these schools for a full ride you know yeah like whatever if california if you're happy going to california western on a full ride and and that's like 
I, I just I I really cringe when people seem like they're about to shortchange their entire legal career because they, you know, they think they've got to hurry. This is um, a student who is a little bit older. And, you know, sometimes that makes people feel like they have to rush to get on with the rest of their life. And I, I understand that, but you're, you're just moving huge numbers around. These are big, big dollars and like rushing into this. I don't know. You need to apply with the very best LSAT you can get and you need to apply broadly. I don't think all the schools have spring start dates, so you need to apply on the normal cycle. Plus, you could additionally apply to these spring start date schools. Uh, that's fine, but just don't make a decision. I mean, I guess the problem with this whole plan is that if she's going to relocate in December, yeah, then that means she's like, there's going to be, there should be applications that are still out. Yeah. Where the result hasn't come back yet. Yeah. So I, I go back to what Ben said, which is, I feel like you're, you're just like these schools then are getting an advantage because you're going to give them more, you know? And it's like, why? Oh, because her, her lease is going to expire. Not a good reason to do anything. You could literally just stay there and make them evict you, which would take months. <laughs> I mean, it's like not, I don't know. I just, that's not a good reason to make law school admissions decisions. Email daily at lsatdemon.com if you'd like to ask us a question or share some LSAT or law school admissions news. Thanks for listening. <laughs>